Section 11 of Robinson Crusoe in Words of One Syllable. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Robinson Crusoe in Words of One Syllable by Lucy Aiken. Section number 11. The foal had brought their boats to land not more than a mile from the tent of the two good men, and it was there that the slave who had run off had been kept. These men had the good luck to see the boats when they were a long way off, so that it took them quite an hour from that time to reach the shore. My friends now had to think how that hour was to be spent. The first thing they did was to bind the two slaves that were left, and to take their wives and as much of their stores as they could to some dark place in the woods. They then sent a third slave to the chief and his men to tell them the news and to ask for help. They had not gone far in the woods when they saw to their great grief and rage that their huts were in flames and that the wild men ran to and fro like beasts in search of prey. But still our men went on and did not halt till they came to a thick part of the wood where the large trunk of an old tree stood, and in this tree they both took their post but they had not been there long when two of the wild men ran that way, and they saw three more, and then five more, who all ran the same way as if they knew where they were. Our two poor men made up their minds to let the first two pass, and then take the three and the five in line as they came up, but to fire at one at a time, as the first shot might chance to hit all three. So the man who was to fire put three or four balls in his gun, and from a hole in the tree took a sure aim, and stood still till the three wild men came so near that he could not miss them. They soon saw that one of these three was the slave that had fled from them, as they both knew him well, and they made up their minds that they would kill him, though they should both fire. At the first shot two of the wild men fell dead, and the third had a graze on his arm, and though not much hurt sat down on the ground with loud screams and yells. When the five men who came next heard the sound of the gun and the slaves' cries, they stood still at first, as if they were struck dumb with fright. So our two men both shot off their guns in the midst of them, and then ran up and bound them safe with cords. They then went to the thick part of the wood where they had put their wives and slaves, to see if all were safe there, and to their joy they found that though the wild men had been quite near them, they had not found them out. While they were here, the chief and his men came up, and told them that the rest had gone to take care of my old house and grove, in case the troop of wild men should spread so far that way. They then went back to the burnt huts, and when they came in sight of the shore they found that their foes had all gone out to sea. So they set to work to build up their huts, and as all the men in the isle lent them their aid, they were soon in a way to thrive once more. For five or six months they saw no more of the wild men, but one day a large fleet of more than a score of boats came in sight, full of men who had bows, darts, clubs, swords, and such like arms of war, and our friends were all in great fear. As they came at dusk, and at the east side of the isle, our men had the whole night to think of what they should do, and as they knew that the most safe way was to hide and lie in wait, they first of all took down the huts which were built for the two good men, and drove their goats to the cave, for they thought the wild men would go straight there as soon as it was day and play the old game. The next day they took up their post with all their force at the wood, near the home of the two men, to wait for the foe. They gave no guns to the slaves, but each of them had a long staff with a spike at the end of it, and by his side an axe. There were two of the wives who could not be kept back, but would go out and fight with bows and darts. The wild men came on with a bold and fierce mien, not in line, but all in crowds here and there, to the point where our men lay in wait for them. When they were so near as to be in range of the guns, our men shot at them right and left with five or six balls in each charge. As the foe came up in close crowds, they fell dead on all sides, and most of those that they did not kill were much hurt, so that the great fear and dread came on them all. Our men then fell on them from three points with the butt end of their guns, swords, and staves, and did their work so well that the wild men set up a loud shriek and flew for their lives to the woods and hills with all the speed that fear and swift feet could help them to do. As our men did not care to chase them, they got to the shore where they had come to the land and where the boats lay. 
But their route was not yet at an end, for it blew a great storm that day from the sea, so that they could not put off. And as the storm went on all that night, when the tide came up, the surge of the sea drove most of their boats so high on the shore that they could not be got off, save with great toil, and the force of the waves on the beach broke some of them to bits. At break of day our men went forth to find them, and when they saw the state of things, they got some dry wood from a dead tree and set their boats on fire. When the foe saw this, they ran all through the isle with loud cries, as if they were mad, so that our men did not know at first what to do with them, for they trod all the corn down with their feet, and tore up the vines just as the grapes were ripe, and did a great deal of harm. At last they brought old Jaff to them, to tell them how kind they would be to them, that they would save their lives, and give them part of the isle to live in, if they would keep in their own bounds, and that they should have corn to plant, and should make it grow for their bread. They were but too glad to have such good terms of peace, and they soon learned to make all kinds of work with canes, wood, and sticks, such as chairs and stools and beds, and this they did with great skill when they were once taught. From this time till I came back to the isle, my friends saw no more wild men. I now told the chief that I had not come to take off his men, but to bring more, and to give them all such things as they would want to guard their homes from foes and cheer up their hearts. The next day I made a grand feast for them all, and the ship's cook and mate came on shore to dress it. We brought out our rounds of salt beef and pork, a bowl of punch, some beer and French wines, and Carl gave the cooks five whole kids to roast, three of which were sent to the crew on board ship, that they, on their part, might feast on fresh meat from shore. I gave each of the men a shirt, a coat, a hat, and a pair of shoes, and I need not say how glad they were to meet with gifts so new to them. Then I brought out the tools, of which each man had a spade, a rake, an axe, a crow, a saw, a knife, and such like things as well as arms, and all that they could want for the use of them. As I saw there was a kind will on all sides, I now took on shore the youth and the maid whom we had brought from the ship that we met on her way to France. The girl had been well brought up, and all the crew had a good word for her. As they both had a wish to be left on the isle, I gave them each a plot of ground on which they had tents and barns built. I had brought out with me five men to live here, one of whom could turn his hand to all sorts of things, so I gave him the name of Jack of all trades. One day the French priest came to ask if I would leave my man Friday here, for through him, he said, he could talk to the black men in their own tongue and teach them the things of God. Need I add, said he, that it was for this cause that I came here? I felt that I could not part with my man Friday for the whole world, so I told the priest that if I could have made up my mind to leave him here, I was quite sure that Friday would not part from me. When I had seen that all things were in a good state on the isle, I set to work to put my ships to rights to go home once more. One day, as I was on my way to it, the youth whom I had brought from the ship that was burnt came up to me and said, Sir, you have brought a priest with you, and while you are here, we want him to wed two of us. I made a guess that one of these must be the maid that I had brought to the isle, and that it was the wish of the young man to make her his wife. I spoke to him with some warmth in my tone, and bade him turn it well in his mind first, as the girl was not in the same rank of life as he had been brought up in. But he said, with a smile, that I had made the wrong guess, for it was Jack of all trades that he had come to plead for. It gave me great joy to hear this, as the maid was as good a girl as could be, and I thought well of Jack. So on that day I gave her to him. They were to have a large piece of ground to grow their crops on, with a house to live in, and sheds for their goats. The isle was now set out in this way. All the west end was left to waste, so that if the wild men should land on it, they might come and go and hurt no one. My old house I gave to the chief, with all its woods, which now spread out as far as the creek, and the south end was for the white men and their wives. It struck me that there was one gift which I had not thought of, and that was the book of God's word, which I knew would give to those who could feel the words in it fresh strength for their work, and grace to bear the ills of life. Now that I had been in the isle quite a month, I once more set sail on the fifth day of May, and all my friends told me that they should stay there till I came to fetch them. End of section 11. Recording by Rene Lacroix. Woodstock, Ontario, Canada.